Well, Dennis Kucinich, I want to welcome you to WMNF. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, John. Good to be with you. Thank you. And before we get to your book, Let's just have people remind you, because you haven't been in politics for a, a little while now, Remind people might remember your presidential run, they might remember your, your time in Congress, and that you were one of America's youngest mayors. So give us a little bit of background about just your political history. Well, sure. I mean, the Division of Light and Power opens up when I'm just elected to Cleveland City Council at age 23. Uh, I went on to become the clerk of the Cleveland Municipal Court. And during that period is when I started the campaign in earnest to save our municipal electric system. Uh, that that uh, created the opening where I could become mayor of Cleveland, America's youngest big city mayor at age 31. I was out of politics for a while. Uh, people who read the book will understand uh, that story. And then when I was um, uh, in 1994, I had a, a, a major political comeback, was elected to the state Senate in 96, was elected to the first of eight terms, served 16 years in the United States Congress. And of course, during that period in 2004 and 2008, I, I had uh, two presidential candidacies, which brought me to the Tampa area uh, many times. So it's great to be with you, Sean, to talk about uh, the division of light and power, its relevancy today, and what people can do if something's going on in their community that they uh, don't either don't understand or when they do understand it, they don't like how they can fight back. And I want to remind people that we are speaking with former member of Congress, Dennis Kucinich. His new book is called The Division of Light and Power, and it's about about the struggles you had and, and that were having they were happening in Cleveland when the your Public, uh, publicly owned municipal utility was trying to be bought out. And so lay that all out for us. A lot sure. of places do have municipal utilities. Some places have private utilities. What's the difference and, and what made uh, what was happening in Cleveland relevant to the rest of us? Well, uh, first of all, if you have a public utility, it's axiomatic going to be cheaper. In Cleveland, our municipal electric uh, utility, MuniLite, uh, provided electricity to about a third of the city at a 20% savings. And of course, you know, being able to pay $80 a month instead of $100 a month for electricity gives a family another $20 a month to be able to spend for things that people need and, you know, for the necessities of life instead of giving the money to a private monopoly. So the monopoly utility that competed door to door in a third of the city with the uh, uh, the private, the public power company, they had a plan. It was secret for a while to take over the city's utility. So they had a complete control and monopoly in the Cleveland area. Cleveland's had public power since the turn of the century. The private utility tried to, they even tried to thwart the beginning of public power at the same time it was created. But then as the story moves, I get elected to city council, the lights are going out at inopportune times. All the lights are out in downtown Cleveland at Christmas time. We have this blackout and there's a series of blackouts that occur. And so the story develops into this into this web of corporate deceit, corporate espionage, corporate sabotage, the private power company actually creating blackouts on the public system, sending their salespeople into Muni Light neighborhoods saying, hey, it looks like your utility isn't working. How'd you like to sign up with us? And the media complicit, ignoring the treachery of this private company, actually supporting it, taking information that comes from the PR offices of the utility monopoly and publishing it often verbatim in the newspaper or in editorials or on radio or TV stations. This is the, a conspiracy that happened against the interests of the people of Cleveland. So I get elected uh, uh, to council, young councilman. I take the reader with me on this, on this journey into, into this morass of corruption and show the reader how, as a young person, I was able to stand up to that and fight back to equip our citizens today with the way in which you can be effective in challenging policies, which you know are wrong. 
Before we get too much further into th that battle against what you call a shadow city government that which engaged in corporate espionage, sabotage, and price fixing, um, before we get into that, you mentioned something at the beginning that um, you you said was something that we should take for granted. But I'll challenge you on that. Why it, why are corporate I'm sorry why are municipal utilities inherently less expensive to the user than than um, corporate because they don't have to pay high corporate salaries. They don't have to pay dividends to shareholders. The dividends are received by the taxpayers in terms of lower taxes. The dividends are received by the rate payers in terms of lower rates for electricity or water or sewer. And so you have to realize that when you're talking about public utilities, this is essential for life today. The mayor who founded Muni Light, Tom Johnson, at the turn of the 20th century said this. He said, I believe in public ownership of all public service facilities, of waterworks, of parks, of electric systems, because if you do not own them, they will in time own you. They'll rule your politics, corrupt your institutions, and finally destroy your liberties. And so the story of the division of light and power is a story of how a utility monopoly ruled the politics of Cleveland, corrupted the institutions of Cleveland, and were on the threshold of destroying our liberties by actually stealing through extortionate conduct of a bank and through bribery, stealing a municipal electric system. So they didn't destroy our liberties. But, you know, in order to stop that, I, I, I had to uh, put everything on the line, including my career and my life. And we'll talk about those things in a moment. I just want to remind people that we're speaking with Dennis Kucinich. He's a former member of Congress, a, a two-time former presidential candidate in the Democratic primaries. His new book is called The Division of Light and Power. It's about the mun municipal utilities in Cleveland and how the private companies were trying to take it over. You also, you just now you mentioned something about a bank. One of America's largest banks threatened to upend the city's financially, unless when you were mayor, you agreed to sell the city's publicly owned electric system. So what was the bank's role and how did you stop it? Well, the bank, on uh, Cleveland Trust Bank, led by uh, Brock Weir, who was their uh, CEO, came to me on the morning of December 15th, 1978, and said this, look, either you sell your municipal electric system to the Cleveland Electric Illuminating Company, or we, the bank, will not renew the city's loans that I hadn't even taken out, they were taken out by my predecessor. That meant the city would be thrown into a financial default. Um, that's, this is the choice I was given. So it turns out that the bank was a business partner of the utility. They had people sitting on the same boards. They had uh, uh, the, the utility uh, used the bank. It's where they put their money. Uh, they invested their pension funds in the bank. The bank was owned a uh, large uh, share of stock in the utility company. So the bank was dealing for itself too. When it tried to extort our municipal electric system, from me as the mayor, all they needed was my signature. And then on top of that, they offered a bribe of $50 million worth of new credit. All I had to do was sign my name and everything would be fine again. And the media played a role because the media was forcing the agenda on behalf of the utility because they got advertising dollars from uh, the utility and they were all in for getting rid of Muni Light. I tell the story and it'll blow your mind if you haven't read the book yet to see how the media subverted the public interest and how reporters who tried to do the right thing lost their jobs. And I spell all this out. And there's never been a story told like this about American politics because no one has, was ever on the inside who said, wait a minute, I'm not doing this and blew the whistle on it all. So yeah, the division of light and power is an unprecedented story of a fight to save a democracy in our community, uh, the people's right to have a, a public facilities that they own, uh, to actually be able to make decisions and not have those decisions dictated from faceless uh, centers of power that uh, want to 
take municipal assets and convert them into their own uh, use. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg. I'm Sean Canan, and my guest is Dennis Kucinich. He's a former member of Congress. He was a two-time candidate for the President of the United States, and his new book is called The Division of Light and Power. It's about how, as mayor of Cleveland, as a young mayor of Cleveland, he was part of saving the municipal utilities there in Cleveland. And in your book, you talk about uh, something you just mentioned, this almost bribe-like uh, Thing that happened in Cleveland, where a, a TV reporter um, interviewed a shadowy convicted hitman for the mob. And that person said, the, the, so the reporter said, why do you think these people would want to do the mayor in? And they're referring to you, Mayor Kucinich. And the hitman said, we can't buy Kucinich. That's what I was told. We can't buy Kucinich. He was cut from a different cloth. The hitman goes on. But what was all that about? Why is Why was a hitman involved here? And why did uh, they think well, that you weren't uh, somebody who they could buy? When I was the clerk of courts prior to becoming mayor, I uh, organized a, when I realized the corruption that was going on and trying to take over our municipal electric system, I organized a civic campaign to block the sale. At that moment, a high powered rifle shot missed my head by a fraction of an inch. And, um, when I was elected, the police intelligence in the city of Cleveland learned from the Maryland State Police, and this is all in a book and it's all documented, that there was an assassination plot afoot. Uh, I asked the head of police intelligence, why, what's going on here? And he told me, he said, look, I'm not involved in politics, but I have to tell you, this is all about Muni Light. You're stopping some people from making a lot of money. Later on, after I left office, and keep in mind, Sean, I never spoke about this danger when I was in office. I knew about it, certainly. I took precautions, but I never talked about it. But years later, the United States Senate uh, subcommittee, a uh, special investigative committee on organized crime in the Midwest unearthed the story of an organized crime assassination plot and when it was supposed to be executed and why. And so, you have to keep in mind that Cleveland in the mid 70s was the bombing capital of America. There was a war going on between rival mob factions for control of the rackets, for control of drugs, gambling, vice, prostitution, loan sharking. And I arrived at City Hall in the middle of this maelstrom. And there were certain things that were expected of a mayor to look the other way on enforcing the law, for example. I didn't go along with any of that. You know, I wasn't going to let the corporations run the city, and I sure wasn't going to let the mob run the city. So that confluence, that 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 mixing of these volatile forces uh, produced a very dangerous situation when I resisted this these efforts coming from every direction to try to force me to sell our municipal electric system, which, by the way, was worth at least a quarter of a billion dollars. That's without even getting into the, the extra cost of taxpayers and ratepayers if it had been sold. It was worth a quarter of a billion dollars. And you know what, Sean? The city was prepared to sell it for $88.1 million, uh, uh, you know, a, about a third of what it was really worth. I mean, so when you think of the money that was out there that was involved, you, know, you add it all up, I was stopping some interest from making a half a billion to a billion dollars. And all I had to do is sign my name and, you know, OK, the deal's done and you can go on being Mayor Dennis and we'll give the city credit and we'll all live happily ever after. And the people will never know the difference. Well, guess what? I wrote the book and now people know the difference and they can look at it and say, whoa, what's going on in my own town? So it's a very important uh, uh, textbook, although it's uh, it's written in a novelist way. It's a. It, it shows people the forces that exist under the surface. And there, you know, if there's something going on in your community, it'll be a, a, a useful guide to be able to fight back. 
So this is the division of light and power is not just a book that's only about the history of what happened in the 70s in Cleveland. It's also kind of an instruction of how people can pay attention to what's happening in their own community, whether they have a municipal utility they're trying to hold on to, or maybe as in the case of Tampa, Tampa has a, a utility that's owned privately, but that comes up for renewal every whatever it is, decade or 15 years. And there have been people in the past who have said, wait a second, why should we just automatically renew with this private utility. Why don't we consider something municipal, which as you had pointed out earlier in the interview, would save people money. Um, Sean, I'll, I'll let you answer that question in just a second. I just wanna remind people, we are talking with Dennis Kucinich, a former member of Congress, former mayor of Cleveland, about his new book, The Division of Light and Power on WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg. I'm Sean Canan, and I apologize for interrupting your answer. No, Sean, look at you, you, you need to identify the station. Um, yeah, I mean, people in Tampa, it might be a good time to start thinking about it. what's the point of a municipally owned utility? Cheaper rates and lower taxes. This is uncomplicated. What, what about the idea of having kind of a, a self-control of having local control of the utility? Because in Florida, the governor recently signed a, a bill into law this week that said, you t the local municipalities can't tell um, power companies what kind of energy they can use. Well, that doesn't apply to municipal utilities. So that's, that might be another added incentive for people to explore owning uh, as a collective, owning their own power companies. Home rule is an essential part of democratic governance. And every, every city uh, has or should have the ability to be able to make decisions regarding self-governance. Uh, what's happened in too many places is that state government is usurping local communities and gaining more power while people at the local level have less. Uh, that will be of consequence politically when people wake up and realize uh, that they're, you know, that for example, Tampa is being run from Tallahassee, hello, or that, Cleveland's being run from Columbus. So you start to think about, this is why this book, The Division of Light and Power, it raises questions. How can you form a utility? We get into that. How does it save money? We get into that. How does it keep taxes low? We get into that. And what are the forces that work to try to suppress it? Oh, do we get into that? So, you know, this book, everything, Sean, is thoroughly documented. You know, a good part of the, the book was spent in, uh, in going uh, deep into court records, into uh, documents that, uh, that were issued in the course of discovery and lawsuits. It's all backed up. And it is, it's, it's an important read for people who you know, want to know how does government really work. And what's going on behind the scenes? And and keep in mind, you know, this experience in Cleveland is what equipped me to go to Congress and learn and see immediately be able to recognize that we were being lied to to take us in a war against Iraq. I, I had the training in Cleveland. I I learned to look at something and say, well, wait a minute, that's you're telling us this is what's happening, but something else is going on. And we, I want to, before we go, I do want to talk a little bit more about Congress, your, your, your time in Congress and your time as a presidential candidate. But before we do that, is there anything that people should know about the division of light and power that we haven't talked about yet? Oh, uh, look, there, the, the book uh, has been compared to Chinatown, the movie. Uh, one, uh, um, one critic said it's a cross between The Godfather and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Uh, I am humbled when it's compared to the work of the great uh, Robert Caro, um, whose, whose work I've always admired. Th th this book ha has something for everyone. It's when, what's interesting is every, you know, any interview that, I, that I've done on the book, each interviewer finds something different. And, and the book is, is, is written on so many different levels that uh, the average citizen can use it, and so can someone who's aspiring to public office, and so can office holders. I, I hope that the book will continue to be a public service. 
Our guest is Dennis Kucinich. He is the author of the new book, The Division of Light and Power. It's about his time as a Cleveland mayor and a Cleveland city council member. But he also has been in Congress. You're listening to WMNF Tampa. This is Sean Canan, and you're listening to WMNF. We are going to switch gears now just briefly to talk about when you were in Congress. You mentioned the run-up to the Iraq War. You were one of the leading voices uh, to say that, hey, wait a second, it may be the Bush administration is not telling us the full truth here. Apparently, the Bush administration fooled some people like um, like Joe Biden and uh, John Kerry and some notable pol political people of the last couple of decades but you weren't fooled. You knew the truth. You know, you you saw through the lies of the Bush administration. I can safely say, 15 years later or 20 years later, that these were lies. That they, that they were falsely leading us. They falsely led us into uh, an unjust war that killed maybe a million people. Um, I can safely say that with history on my side now. And but you were out in front saying that you also were advocating for a Department of Peace. So tell us a little bit about what the Department of Peace would have been and why you have believed that unlike people like John Kerry and Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton, that the Bush administration was lying. Well, again, you know, if you read the Division of Light and Power, you'll understand how I was able to see through the lies because I did my homework. I studied. I, I insisted on getting answers to questions. And I kept questioning. I'm not that much different than anybody else. I mean, anybody could have done that. Anybody could have taken the time in Cleveland to ask the questions that I did, but they didn't. And when you read the book, you'll see that I developed this capacity for being able to, you know, see through those lies. So when I got to Congress, I knew instantly they were lying. Matter of fact, Sean, anyone uh, of your listeners could right now Go to a search engine, type in Kucinich Iraq Analysis, October 2nd, 2002. And you'll see an analysis that I passed out on the floor of Congress, put it in the hands of members of Congress so that people couldn't say later, oh, we didn't know. They knew. And I, I, I was able to prove chapter and verse that there was no there was no proof Iraq had anything to do with 9-11 or Al-Qaeda's role in 9-11. Iraq didn't have the intention or capability of attacking the United States. And this whole case for war was being trumped up. And I made that point back in October of 2002. Now, the Department of Peace, this proposal came forward on July the 11th, 2001, two months before 9-11. And it's aimed at moving our society away from a culture of war to a culture of peace, where we work to make nonviolence an organizing principle in our society. And that is to challenge the assumption that, well, we're just violent and that's the way it's going to be, that violence in America is apple pie. No, it's not. Violence is a learned response and so is not violence. And so the Department of Peace had an international component where it, it looked at uh, being able to uh, resolve conflicts before they get out of control. And it has a domestic component as well. And so I'm now advocating a civic peace department in the city of Cleveland. Uh, so we can look at the root causes of violence. Violence is, is percolating in all of our major cities now, uh, but we're not getting underneath. Why is this happening? And I'm, I'm determined to take an approach that is both uh, analytical and felicitous, that we, we have to believe that as human beings, we have the capacity to evolve, that we can become more than we are and better than we are in a qualitative sense. And so the Department of Peace became a national movement that still exists today. So we can stand for peace or we can stand for war. And the United States, unfortunately, uh, throughout most of our lives has stood for war. And those wars, for the most part, have been uh, based on lies. As, uh, and so I can say that because I proved it, just like I proved the case of what was going on in Cleveland and the attempt to usurp the public interest using um, um, a, a, a vicious uh, exploitation of the community and, and, and a raw exercise of corporate power and financial power to damage 
uh, the people and the institution of the city. Our guest is Dennis Kucinich. He's the author of The Division of Light and Power. He's a former member of Congress, former presidential candidate. I'm Sean Canan. This is WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, 88.5 FM. And Representative Kucinich, if I could, I don't know if uh, you're prepared to answer this, but are, what can you tell us about some of the, the uh, work that your wife, Elizabeth Kucinich, has been doing? Sean, you know what? Uh, she is an amazing woman, uh, 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 a woman whose opinions on agroecology are sought globally. She's lectured all around the world on how we can restore the land and, and enrich it with, with uh, uh, higher levels of carbon, drawing it down through sequestration, how we can save water. Uh, how, you know, through various uh, uh, technologies. Amazing woman. You, I, I'll tell her that we talked and she's worth uh, an interview uh, every, every bit of the time or more so than I am. <laughs> well, absolutely. I'd be happy to interview Elizabeth Kucinich someday soon. Well, I, those were my questions. If there's anything else that you'd like to add before we go, uh, what would you like to say? Well, Sean, if you have a website that you can direct people to the Division of Light and Power, I'd be very appreciative. Uh, this is an opportunity for people not just to share in some hard fought experience, uh, but also to equip oneself to know more about how the system works and to find out how you can fight back. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming back on WMNF, Dennis Kucinich. Thank you.